in the introduction of hard times, Thomas Gradgrind, one of the wealthy leaders of Coketown, runs a school where curriculum is based entirely on nothing but facts. His oldest children, Tom and Louisa, attend the school. The students spend their days being drilled about facts and scolded if they express any evidence of imagination. In the rising action, Mr. Gradgrind and Mr. Bounderby find Sissy Jupe running through the streets, trying to escape from Bitzer's taunts. Sissy's circus performer father has abandoned her in hope she will get an education and live a better life without him. The Gradgrinds take Sissy in. A factory worker, Stephen Blackpool, visits Mr. Bounderby and learns he can't divorce his wife. Years pass. Tom Gradgrind takes an apprenticeship with Mr. Bounderby at his bank. When Mr. Bounderby asks Louisa to marry him, Tom pressures her to accept the proposal to help smooth his indiscretions. Louisa accepts, but her engagement and marriage cool her friendship with Sissy. The spoiled and privileged James Harthouse becomes close to Louisa and decides to seduce her. Mr. Bounderby fires Stephen for refusing to be a union informant, as well as airing his grievances as a factory worker. Stephen leaves Coketown to find work elsewhere, and shortly after he leaves, the bank is robbed. Mr. Bounderby immediately suspects Stephen because of their quarrels and because Stephen was spotted loitering around the bank. Louisa vaguely suspects Tom might be behind the robbery. Meanwhile, Mrs. Gradgrind dies, and Mrs. Sparsett comes to stay at the Bounderby's country house, plotting against Louisa and spying on her. In the climax, Louisa goes to her father's house to confess a near affair with Hardhouse, who's professed his love, throwing her into crisis. In the falling action, Mr. Bounderby learns Louisa did not actually have an affair, but still demands she get over her emotional breakdown and come home right away. Louisa does not return, and the marriage effectively ends. Sissy and Rachel search for Stephen and find he's fallen into a coal pit. He's pulled from the pit, but he succumbs to his injuries and dies. Sissy helps Tom escape after he's revealed as the bank robber. And in the resolution, Louisa and Sissy settle into relatively contented lives, promoting happiness and imagination among the people of Coketown. There are seven key characters in the Charles Dickens novel of facts, factories, and friendship, Hard Times. Louisa Gradgrind absorbs her father's teachings about the value of factual analysis and pure reason as a child, rejecting imagination and sentiment completely. She marries Mr. Bounderby, a man 30 years older, because she believes it matters little whom she marries and has no other prospects at the time. When she meets James Harthouse, she spins into a crisis of conscience and must reevaluate her understanding of herself and her world. Mr. Josiah Bounderby proudly, loudly, and frequently proclaims to have been born in a ditch, abandoned there by his mother, and rescued by an abusive grandmother who raised him. None of that is true. He believes his factory workers feel entitled to what he calls luxuries, but are really basic necessities of life. Mr. Thomas Gradgrind raises his students and his children to embrace factual analysis and logic. He grows increasingly fond of his kind-hearted and imaginative ward, Sissy Jupe. Later, he abandons pure reason for a more balanced approach to life. Tom Gradgrind grows up feeling resentful of his father's philosophies and hating his own work. Referred to as a whelp, Tom is often irresponsible, entitled, selfish, disreputable, and dishonest. He steals from the bank and attempts to frame Stephen Blackpool for the crime. Sissy Jupe is the daughter of a circus clown who hopes his daughter will get an education and have a more stable life than he and the circus could provide. Sissy is a poor student of Mr. Gradgrind's facts and reason-based curriculum, but she realizes facts are not the only basis for knowledge. Stephen Blackpool works in one of Mr. Bounderby's factories and is married to an alcoholic he'd like to divorce so he can marry Rachel, the woman he loves. But divorce is not possible for people with no money and influence. He does his duty and work until his honesty and desire to avoid trouble anger both the union organizer and his employer. Mrs. Sparsett was born and married within a higher class than her occupation, as Mr. Bounderby's housekeeper implies. She plots against Louisa, accidentally exposing Mr. Bounderby's fraudulent life story. The loom, a bottle of nine oils, the circus, and the bank are the central symbols in the Charles Dickens novel, Hard Times. Stephen Blackpool makes multiple references to his loom, a steam-powered machine used widely in textile factories after industrialization. For Stephen, the loom symbolizes the dominance of work in the lives of the workers and the narrow definition of the worker's sense of self and place in the world, as well as the overwhelming power of work that keeps Stephen tethered to a bleak, monotonous, and unchangeable existence. 
One of the last things Mr. Jupe does before leaving is send Sissy to get him a bottle of nine oils, a remedy for the aches and pains he suffers from doing acrobatics during his performances. Sissy keeps the bottle. To Mr. Gradgrind, the bottle symbolizes Sissy's childlike feelings about her father, her unwillingness to accept facts and accept her father is not coming back. For Sissy, however, the bottle represents unfailing hope and love for her father, sentimentality that provides her with emotional stability in the face of his abandonment. With clowns, acrobats, and elaborate horse riding shows based on legendary themes, the circus symbolizes the triumph of imagination and whimsy, or what Mr. Gradgrind would call fancy. Circus performers provide factory workers an escape from the monotony and squalor of everyday life. Mr. Gradgrind and Mr. Bounderby dismiss the circus, in turn, and that represents a restrictive worldview that neglects the validity of fanciful human joy. In stark contrast to the haphazard whimsy of the circus, the bank is a regimented and organized space, cleaner than the factories, but dismal and restrictive in its own way. Set up in rows that echo the rows of machines in a factory, Tom Gradgrind finds his place in the bank as oppressive as Stephen Blackpool finds the factory. As a symbol of wealth, the bank shows how wealth oppresses those who don't have it. A nondescript but imposing brick structure, the bank is inaccessible to those who do not have money, and thus serves as a physical reminder of what people living in poverty can never obtain. Industrialization, reason and imagination, childhood and love are the central themes in hard times. Industrialization speaks to the people of Coketown, where physical pollution reflects the pollution present in the residents' minds and spirits. Industrialization creates an economic class structure that determines the course of each individual's life, with little mobility existing between classes. Stephen Blackpool illustrates the fate of most people born into poverty. Stephen Blackpool illustrates how if someone is born with a little bit of wealth, he may be able to grow that wealth, but if a man has nothing, he's likely to remain with nothing. Reason and imagination speaks to the teachers and masters at Mr. Gradgrind's school, presenting factual knowledge and adherence to pure reason as the keys to a successful and satisfying life. In their narrow worldview, wondering and imagination have no value. According to Mr. Bounderby and Mr. Gradgrind, the lower classes remain poor because they distract their minds with entertainment, such as the displays of the circus or books of fairy stories, instead of focusing entirely on facts or the hard work. Pure reason cannot provide sufficient guidance in the complex world of human behavior and emotions. The lessons and experiences of childhood shape these characters later in life. For Louisa, the emphasis on reason and the rejection of imagination and emotion in her childhood led her to an unbalanced adulthood. For Tom, the emphasis on reason in his childhood deprives him of pleasure and leads him to reject his family. Sissy Jupe experiences a more balanced childhood, which tempers the strict education she receives and gives her emotional and imaginative grounding. Love transcends the forces of fact and the fancies of imagination. Louisa Gradgrind, emotionally numb, is devoted to her brother Tom beyond the bounds of reason. Mr. Gradgrind's devotion to Louisa moves him to change his life's driving philosophy. Sissy Jupe never abandons hope her father will one day return for her. Mrs. Pegler remains loyal to her son, Mr. Bounderby. Anne, Stephen Blackpool, and Rachel love each other and are pained by the knowledge they cannot marry or openly express their love. There are two main motifs in hard times, city and country, and turtle soup, venison, and a gold spoon. In many novels, the countryside is presented as an idyllic contrast with the dangers and corruptions of city life. Coketown is oppressive, dirty, and at best, nondescript. The factory buildings are indistinguishable from one another, as are the hands that work inside them. Everything is obscured by soot and smoke. Coketown is described as a place of extreme utility. Nothing in the city is not useful, and little is beautiful. However, the countryside serves only as a place where the physical and emotional pollution of the city spills over and spreads its corruption too. The landscape is dotted with coal pits, both working and disused. 
The railway slashes through the trees and hills. One of the coal pits consumes Stephen Blackpool when he falls in by accident and dies of his injuries. The country is no safer than the city. The concerns of the city, James Harthouse included, intruding on Louise's country life show how the dangers of urbanization and industrialization continually encroach and destroy. Turtle soup, venison, and a gold spoon is a three-in-one motif. Mr. Bounderby repeatedly refers to this trilogy of luxury items to represent his understanding of the worker's aspirations. The turtle soup, venison, and gold spoon are Mr. Bounderby's metaphor for his ironically unrealistic beliefs about the sense of entitlement he sees in others. Turtle soup and venison are expensive and specialized food items, and the gold spoon, a far better and classier utensil than the steel or wooden spoons workers likely use. Mr. Bounderby uses this exaggerated metaphor as a means of denying his workers any improvements at all because he thinks they want too much. On a second level, this motif represents Mr. Bounderby's, and other factory owners, unrealistic assessment of workers' needs and desires. Mr. Bounderby is quick to use this metaphor when he perceives anyone's desire for more than he's willing to provide, not simply to respond to the entitlement he perceives in his workers, but to respond to entitlement he perceives in the world in a general sense.